So guys, hello, uh, hello Martin. Uh, we have uh, a next speaker, Martin McMillan, CEO of Pool in VC. He will tell us about funding and growing Hyper Casual uh, Studio without a publisher. Please, Martin, welcome on stage. Great, thank you very much. Very nice to be here, Alexander. Um, so yeah, so my name is Martin McMillan. I'm the CEO of Pollen VC, based in uh, uh, based in London. I will uh, just give you a little bit about who we are and what we do and where we kind of fit in the ecosystem to start off, and then we'll get into uh, the, the the topic of discussion is how to fund and scale a hyper casual studio without necessarily going with a publisher. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit about our company. We we provide finance. We provide credit facilities to to developers. Um, which enables them to grow their business in a, in a more efficient way. So basically, we lend money against um, what we call receivables, uh, revenues, ad impressions that you've generated but not been paid for. So we basically bridge the funding delay and provide these super flexible credit facilities to allow you to, um, to scale very fast using, using paid UA. Um, so our kind, of, our, our kind of underlying missions of companies to get developers thinking about different forms of financing so uh, rather than just like always think about venture capital financing or in this case or you know i needed the, my only route to market is through a publisher if you're a little bit more savvy and understand the financial planning aspects of it there are, you know it, it opens up different models for uh, for, for different studios um, so <clears throat> so it starts off with a nutty question right publisher or self-publish and this isn't there's not a binary answer for this it's not a right size you know yeah you should always self publish or you should always go with the publisher it's just basically making making the informed decision based on where your studio is at and what is what what is right for you um so uh, again you know there, obviously there are lots and lots of different things that, that publishers do and they can add a huge amount of value in in you know many many areas but rather than try to sort of decant them all here basically um Essentially, we're look, looking at sort of two camps of uh, of studios. So, when when to work with a publisher? So, if a, if as a studio you don't you don't really have any UA expertise or no significant expertise, so it's something you need to rely on a third party for. Um, exactly the same on the monetization side as well. If you are not an expert in, and having all the tools and the BI and so on, knowing how to kind of optimize your monetization stack, then again, you know, that's somewhere where a publisher can have a huge amount of cap of, um, of, uh, of assistance. Um, and then thirdly, the bit we tend to focus on more as, as, uh, as a finance provider is, and, and a lot of the developers we talk to, they, if they're not able to, um, you know, a big part of working with the publishers is like, you need a lot of money to scale. It's capital intensive business. You need a lot of money to scale up quickly. Um, if you want to achieve the sort of um, you know, the, 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 the top of the charts and, and hyper casual success, so that is a big part of uh, you know why people tell us you know I'm working with publishers in these games. Now at the other end of the the, the, the spectrum, again this is this is like a little bit of introspection as to you know who you are, who you want to be as a studio, um, and let's say as a studio you've got a decent amount of UA expertise in house, <clears throat> and it all it all seems to be becoming kind of more programmatic and algorithmic and so on. And obviously, with hypercash, it's fairly broad targeting anyway. So you've got the UA expertise, and let's say you've got the monetization expertise. So you've got, you know, you've been around the the, the block a few times. You've seen how to do this. Um, and then thirdly, it's and really important that you have to have some capital um, if you want to self-publish. You don't need to have a million dollars, uh, you know, just sitting in the bank or two million bucks just ready to scale a game all the way up the charts. But you have to have some you know, amount of capital to, to, to start the party. So that, that's, that's really important. And so in, in a way, sometimes, and some of the interest that we're, we're seeing at the moment is from studios who are maybe doing their, you know, their second or third game, whatever. They've, they've worked with publishers. They've, they've figured out a lot of how things work. They've got some experience, them, you know, plenty of failures under your, under your belt and so on as well. But in thinking about that, you know, who do we want to be, you know, do we want to have our, our name on the door here? Do we want to, to go down the self-publishing route? Then um, there are there are there are financing options available to, to do that. And what we're going to do in, in this session is just look at some of the underlying kind of you know financial mechanics that are you know particularly acute in um, in hyper casual. Um, so really, of course, the a, a very very important thing here is just with, with user acquisition, just think of it as if you're a fund manager, as if you're an an, an investor. And there's three things you care about. How much in, when do you break even, how much out? And the, uh, you know, building building that journey, basically, it comes down to this. So let's say I've got a 20 cent acquisition cost 
you know, I break even in five days and I return an extra 10 cents of LTV. So I break it. So I've got a 30 day LTV of 30 cents, whatever. Um, th these are the core kind of uh, nuggets of the, uh, of, of the formula. Um, if we then, you know, consider the install velocity of hypercasual is super important, right? If you, you can't just sort of um, go with a little bit of money and hope to gradually scale up the charts. It's just not the way it works. So uh, what you need to do in your planning is to make sure you've got figured out your financial models where you're saying, well, how quickly am I going to, you know, am I going to run out of my own cash? And is there an available finance that I can then recycle more cash back into it? Because if you start to scale, then you run out of money. Let's say your credit card gets maxed out or, you know, you just you just run out of puff. You can't you can't physically spend. You'll just drop like a stone. And so it takes a sustained amount of capital um, and, and, and time before the algorithms sort of get tired of the creatives and so on as well, and you would naturally kind of crest off. So install velocity is super important. The other thing is then ROAS. <clears throat> so uh, in, in our world, you know, ROAS is critical. It's like, what day do you break even? And that, that basically defines your, um, <clears throat> your, your success criteria in terms of, and obviously the shorter the better, um, and that's going to that's gonna really in, impact your financial modeling. Um, so I mentioned one, one thing we do as a, as a company is we really try and um, help educate the market around financial concepts. And we recently re released a new, um, a new resource online, which is just a completely free to use online um, <clears throat> resource, the website called CFO Resources. So this is basically a collection of tools to help you do two different things. First of all, model your unit economics of um, of acquisition, model them on a PL basis, so ROAS and LTV, and then overlay the payment delays of the of the ad network, so you get a you get a consolidated kind of cash position. Um, <clears throat> the one we're going to look at here is what we call the hype. Um, well, actually, the, the, there's a few others. There's there's different forms of financing. There's uh, you know the the revenue based loan and the fixed fee versus interest rate. These are designed to help unpick different sort of financing down to just a basic interest rate. The one we're going to look at today is the hyper, what we call hyper casual velocity calculator. Um, so <clears throat> this calculator here just asks you just one really simple question. Um, how many days is it before you break even on your ad spend? And then on the back of that, what we do is we look at the different payment delays of all the different ad networks. So if you invest, you know, let's say your dollar here, um, <clears throat> how long is it before that dollar comes out? So, so, so day one, you get an, you, you, Acquire a user. How long is it before you actually um, you know, get the get the dollar of ad revenue from from the ad network, and what impact does that have in your business? <clears throat> the question we're asking here is basically, given the payment terms of each of the ad networks, how how many times could you theoretically recycle the same dollar around the track, take it out, reinvest it, take it out, reinvest it, in this in a single payment cycle of each of each of the ad networks? So if I go back to my example before and I move this down to say. Um, uh, a five-day um, return on ad spend, <clears throat> you can basically recycle that dollar anything between, what's that, six and 15 times within one payment cycle of the ad networks. So if you had elastic access to this capital and you could take it out and reinvest it every time you break even, that's how much faster you could be putting money around the track. Um, so please have a look at some of these uh, resources. We always look at, um, it, it's always really helpful to have uh, <clears throat> comments and feedback on them. Um, and that's going to be the sort of the underlying concept because the the, the use case in hyper casual for this, um, you know, obviously real it's a real time is money concept. So it's really important to think about some of the timing concepts. Um, so please do uh, use that as a as a resource if that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I go back to my presentation here. Um, Sorry, give me a second. I need to put the navigator on. Um, so, so with that, let, let's have a look at you know understanding payment cycles and understanding credit lines from uh, from UA networks. And then you know if I if I've got the sort of slightly more informed knowledge, then how do I you know how should I be thinking about it? So if you think you know if you're lucky enough to have a credit line from you know one of the major ad networks, typically what will happen is uh, you will be, you know, you'll be spending from the, say, the 1st to the 31st of the month, and then the bill is due at the end of the next month, right? So let's say it's the beginning of January, you're spending merrily your credit line through January, you need to pay the bill at the end of February. Um, sometimes it could be longer, um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, 
typically most are on 30 day terms. Um, so then, you know, again, go back to ROAS. What point am I breaking even there? And this is, um, you know, there's, there's two things. What point am I, do I break even? And what does that then go on to in terms of, you know, where do I cut off my LTV? Is it 21 days? Is it 30 days? Um, and let's think about that. Um, <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to do here <clears throat> is I'm going to think about my average payables days. So how many days is it before, you know, I'm serving ads, how long is it before I actually get paid? And why is the, you know, why is the, <clears throat> the payment terms of the ad network so important? And the reality is it's basically like the longer the payment terms, if you are self-publishing, the more capital you require, because if you keep spending on UA, you're going to burn through your own capital before you've had the payouts from the ad networks. <clears throat> so this is really, really critical. So if you think about it, you know, from a revenue point of, of, of view, uh, view, let's say you go back to your January example, you're accruing uh, sales all the way through January. And the way to look at it is what you want to calculate is your average payables days. So it's the average number of days between an impression served and the cash comes in. <clears throat> so if you if you served um, ads on a excuse me <clears throat> on a on a linear basis through a uh, consistent basis through the month, you would take the midpoint in the month as your start point, and then you need to think about when you're actually uh, going to get paid. So the shortest ad networks are typically around net 15, 15 days from the end of the month. So that means if I've got the middle of one month to the middle of the next month, that's giving me average weight of 30 days. And then what happens, it goes progressively out from there. So, so typically the, 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 the worst payers may be net 60. So that's basically, if, you, if you're serving ads in the beginning of January, you won't get paid until the end of March. So in that case, if you want to keep trying to scale your business, you need a huge war chest of capital um, or you need access to capital um, uh, quicker, than, quicker than that. So then, you know, very often people don't think around what happens when you've got a, um, you know, a, a, a credit facility already in place on the UA side. So what you'd ideally want to do as a developer, selfishly, you would want to transfer all the LTV risk on the ad network and hope that it all works. In reality, the ad networks will give you credit, but it's it's they're not in the business of really taking LTV risk on you. Uh, so you get this kind of toing and froing. So let's look at a, a theoretical example here of, you know, I'm spending from you know, day one to day thirty in my credit facility, but it's then it's then capped out. So I'm looking at my P and L in terms of you know on a daily basis how much money am I actually um, <clears throat> earning on a on a daily basis, and then when do I need to pay the bill? Um, so this this is all looking good on a. P&L basis, and by P&L, I'm talking about the day, you know, you're recording these things on a, on a daily basis. Um, <clears throat> however, when you think about actual cash, um, it's a totally different, uh, it's a totally different thing. So what you're talking about here is like, you think on a, on a P&L basis, I'm good, I've got this money, but unfortunately, I haven't been paid it yet. So if I want to, so basically, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cap out my credit line probably fairly quickly. Um, and I'm just not going to have the funds because the ad networks haven't paid me in order to pay the UA network. Now, some people will net off um, uh, their, their payments. So they'll say, look, if you're doing your UA and your monetization with us, you can do it in this sort of closed loop structure, which might work well for you if that particular network is your primary choice of UA and your primary choice of monetization, then great, you're, all, you're golden. However, what most people find is that certain networks are most effective for UA, other networks are better. So unless you can unless you can cross the funds between them, it doesn't really it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, so very often we see people who are who are capped out on their ability to um, to, to spend money, or they just say like my credit cards are maxing out, which is another certain you know certain death. You. Uh, you start scaling on the credit card, it's, it maxes out, and then it takes several days for it to get repaid. You don't get a second bite of the cherry. So normally it's like this, when, when developers are doing their planning, they're thinking about how am I, how am I gonna fund this? Do I have enough capital to do it? Or am I gonna, do I need to go with the, down the publisher route and I'm effectively renting their balance sheet for, um, for user acquisition? So then look at, Look at another way. We, we fund a bunch of different hyper-casual uh, studios and also publishers. Um, <clears throat> and what we're doing is we're providing these credit facilities to them 
in order that they can keep spending. So again, what happens is, and, and our normal payout structure is generally once a week. With hyper-casual developers, we can do it twice a week or even on demand because literally every day is money. The quicker your ROAS recovery, uh, the the more you can, you know, the more credit you can you can draw, and then you can use that credit immediately to recycle in. So you get more towards uh, to, to, towards this scenario where you would always want to max out your your uh, your credit line with the ad network. It's free money. You might as well. Um, so you always want to max that up, but then keep it topped up with additional capital that you are taking out because you're earning this money every day. You just haven't been paid it. So if you can access this capital and use it to recycle quickly, um, you can keep spending without having to have an enormous war chest. Um, <clears throat> so if you go back to the the the, the, the planning aspects, then this is this is really important. The, it's super intensive. You know, very often you hear people spending a million, two million, even more to really scale a, um, <clears throat> a hyper casual game quickly. So, um, you know, you think about how you fund that. Do you go and raise VC money and say, hey, I need a few million bucks of war chest just to put into user acquisition? Or do you look at different ways of, um, uh, of funding this? And, you know, in, in this case, because the payback periods are so quick, then using AR, uh, accounts receivable credit facilities, is a very, very efficient way to scale. So um, uh, again, it all comes down to planning and everyone needs to, to, to kind of up their game, uh, I think, in terms of like you know, thinking through just the, the, the core mechanics of like, you know, what, what am I spending? What's the profile of when I'm, when I'm going to get this paid? And then how should I optimize my capital structure? How much equity should I raise? Do I need any equity? How much, how much of a debt facility do I need, et cetera? Um, and just think, think a little bit more um, acutely about, uh, <clears throat> about the finances behind it. Um, and then next, I, I'm just going to do one slide on this. I think there's a whole different topic here. We've had a bunch of uh, super interesting conversations recently. So typically in terms of like designing the monetization stack, you know, if, if you're still sort of programming this stuff manually, typically everyone is focused on, you know, the, the, the rational thought is you put in place the highest yielding CPMs you know, down, down the waterfall. So you're always going to look to, to do the highest highest first. And what we're advocating for here is it's not just the CPMs that matter. It's not just the, the headline revenue that matters. You have to take into account when that actually gets paid and therefore what the opportunity cost is by waiting for someone who's going to give you a slightly higher CPM versus uh, the, the, the reinvestment criteria. <clears throat> so think really, really carefully here about the time value of money. Um, if you can invest and break even in a three, four, five, ten day cycle, whatever it is, then you have to consider if someone has got you know a very, very slightly higher CPM rate, but I'm going to have to wait an extra month for the money. Well, if I could recycle that same dollar four or five or six times within the same month, then it's a false economy. So I really what what we're kind of advocating for here is think about adjusting your stack not just on the headline CPM payouts but analyze the payment terms and also your reinvestment terms and figure out say okay based on you know based on the slightly refined way of thinking about it you know what should my stack look like and you may find it's the shorter pairs at the top um, even though uh, even though their um, their CPMs may not be as high in some circumstances. Um, so all we're really saying is like, you know, think about the terms and think about the opportunity cost of not having the actual cash if you want to self-publish and you want to be reinvesting. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, you know, that's on, you know, just some thoughts on the waterfall. And really, and again, obviously, we, we have a fairly sort of binary view of the world and very, very focused on, um, on UA. And the way we think about it, and this is after... After almost seven years of, 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 of doing what we do, so we've seen, we've been around the block and seen a lot of stuff, and we really just think of user acquisition as a machine. You can be kind of super dispassionate about it um, and just look at it with a very, very analytical lens. And really what we're asking is three questions. Do I have a machine? And what I mean by that is, can you put 20 cents in and make 25 or 30 cents or 24 cents, whatever it is? Do I have something that I can put money into UA and I can fairly confidently uh, earn a return, and if so, oh, and, and understand also the time. How long does it take me to get the money out the other side? 
So if you understand that your UI works and you have positive, positive economics, which is obviously a big if, um, then the next question you go on to is like, how am I going to fund the machine? Where am I going to find the capital to put into this investment equation that I know is ROI positive? And you can do that in a relatively form formulaic way, <clears throat> which we'll go through in a second. And then the next one is like, when is my machine running at full capacity? So if something is working, it's not going to go on forever. There are going to be market forces, demand supply forces that are going to tell you when you just physically can't spend any more or can't spend any more profitably. So we're going to look at look, look at um, this in a little bit more detail and introduce this idea of what we call the capital stack. So let's say you um, <clears throat> you you know that UA is, is profitable. And so you know the well is open for drinking and you've got to figure out where am I going to get the capital from to put into this equation. Uh, and you start off basically by your cheapest cost of capital and then you work down various different options, more expensive until it doesn't make sense anymore and you stop spending. <clears throat> so at the very top, if one of the ad networks is going to give you a credit line, it's effectively an, an LTV risk transfer from, you know, from you onto them, you should absolutely take it. So max that out and keep it maxed out. It's free money. The next is like, how much cash have I got in the bank? So maybe you've had a successful hyper casual title or something. Uh, you have a bunch of free cash flow in the bank and you want to use that next. <clears throat> um, people have, uh, we see this less people using credit cards to fund UA um, because what happens is if you've got a new game, a new studio and you start to scale really quickly, then either your bank or the ad networks bank, whatever, is very, very likely to throttle that spend and stop you spending huge amounts of money your credit cards are going to get maxed out, and you know, even even if not, then unless you've got like a million dollar limit in your credit card um, to to blow you right up the charts in a month, it's going to be it's going to be hard. So, but it's just worth worth calling out there. The next one down the stack is is credit facilities. So it's people like us that will lend you money against um, <clears throat> the ad impressions that you've clocked up but not been paid for, um, and then right at the bottom. Uh, Thankfully, we see this a lot less. People just going out and raising equity funding just for user acquisition and needlessly diluting themselves, um, which is obviously incredibly expensive. So the way to think about it is, um, like most things in life, super simple. Look over, a, um, and typically we look at it on a 30-day basis. So if you, look, if you go back to our example of you know, 20 cent install cost, day five, um, uh, day five break even, and then 30 cents after 30 days in terms of LTV. Um, break everything down to the sort of like monthly return on, on, on investment on ad spend. So if you put 20 cents in and you get 30 cents out after a month, you're making a 50% return on investment. Now, if you don't have the capital to put in, so you have to go and borrow the dollar to put in the first or the 20 cents to put in the first place, and you have to pay interest on that, what does the interest cost you for a month? So let's say, and you know, keeping the number simple here, it's actually a little bit less than this, but let's say it cost you 2% to borrow the 20 cents for a month. Your profit, your, your profit is 48%. So you're making a 50%, it costs you 2% to finance it over the same period. Your profit's still 48%. And the most successful hyper-casual developers who are self-publishing are super focused on the, on the profit metric. Um, and then lastly, when is your machine at capacity? Uh, and this is really just down to demand economics, right? So you've got, you know, as sure as uh, death and taxes, acquisition costs will rise over time. Um, and this can obviously happen very quickly in hyper casual. LTVs will fall as you scale. You go after, a, you know, concentric circles of uh, less relevant audiences over time. So naturally, they're going to spend less or, in this case, uh, watch less ads. Um, and what you need to do is to try and model what the shape of the curves are. Now, it's a very difficult thing to do because there are a million factors on a daily basis kind of um, it, it, it thrown into this. But basically, uh, what you're trying to do is to figure out the, the shape of both of those curves, which are chopping around, and at what point does it stop making sense to, uh, to invest. So the key thing here is go back, and as every good hyper-casual publisher does and any hyper-casual developer seeking to self-publish, Obviously, all about numbers. Every single day, every hour of every day, you need to be keeping tracking so that you are not uh, knowingly spending money on something that is not gonna not gonna return. And then I just wanted to do one final thought, um, and this again is just like empirical evidence of working with tons and tons of different studios, small studios. Basically, you have the founders doing the building games, doing UA, doing everything. But as companies get bigger, they separate off into different departments. 
Um, and one of the biggest disconnects we've spotted in just funding, you know, a hundred and something developers over the last few years is the, the often the disconnect between the finance teams and the UA teams. So it's like the finance guys don't understand the real gritty metrics of UA and the UA guys don't understand the finance team. So the worst thing you can do is to say, I have a budget of this much and the UA manager goes to spend it. And you know, that, that's their kind of, you know, their measurement. They want as, as many high paying uh, users as, as possible. Just think of it back to the machine concept and it really should be the finance team and the UA team just working in complete synergy to figure out this machine. Have we got the machine? And if so, how are we together going to fund it? Um, and so we can squeeze every every cent of profit out of the out of the opportunity. Um, <clears throat> so that was uh, that was it in terms of my slides. Uh, hopefully that was um, helpful and, and, and gives you guys a new perspective and someone who's thinking about you know self publishing as opposed to as to going. Um, going with a publisher, and as I say, it's not a it's not a one size fits all. Um, you know, there are many great publishers out there, and you know, a lot of developers need the expertise and you know capital and everything else that they that they bring. <clears throat> and then there is this sort of emerging breed of people, uh, certainly we're seeing empirically, that are looking to self publish in the in the hyper casual, hybrid casual type of space. Um, who we are, you know, we are financing and and, and helping to grow. In, a, in an efficient way. So it's really just down to what sort of company, who you are, what you want to be, and then just being making informed choices about, you know, structuring and financing um, the business and, and, you know, becoming the studio you want to become. So uh, I think as we might have just a couple of minutes uh, of, um, of questions. I don't know if any questions have come in on the chat there. Thank you, Martin. Your uh, speech was absolutely awesome. And I believe is pretty unusual uh, speaking about uh, planning funds and working with money is not something uh, many people uh, teach uh, to do in game development industry. So I really appreciate the knowledge you have brought to us. Um, I have uh, the first question. I'll use uh, my position as a moderator to ask you the first question. Um, actually, uh, who's, uh, uh, who's your target audience? Who's your ideal partner uh, it, it, your product is targeted for? Um, which studio uh, it, it should definitely get in contact with you? So, so on one hand, we want to be like super accessible for everyone, right? That's why we have these CFO resources and tools and so on on there. So, our, our big thing really we want, we want to help educate. We want to provide you know free tools, free resources for people to figure some of the stuff out, model things out, whatever. And you know, if someone then is like looking to you know meets those criteria of like you know they've got the skills that they can do UA and monetization, and all they're really looking for is basically capital to scale, and that was influencing the decision to go with a publisher or not, then we can be a good fit because it's just a case of how quickly can you take the money out and recycle back into user acquisition. So it's definitely not for everyone. There's a there's a there, there's a certain sort of subsection there, um, but that's the uh, that's our sort of our, that, that's who we can be a good financing partner for. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And what if uh, uh, the studio already has a publisher? Uh, how to combine? Is it possible to work with you? And if yes, how to combine it with uh, uh, work with publisher? Uh, not not really, because the publisher is really controlling all the cash flows. So you're using the the publishers using their own credit facilities, their own using their own balance sheet, etc. And the developers will get a will get a payout, a revenue share payout from that. Um, <clears throat> so it's not. I mean, it's it's not. Um, it's not really possible to combine the two. What is possible and what we've seen is people who've worked with publishers for previous titles, and now they're considering, hey, I've got a new one coming to market. How am I going to do this? So the studios, you know, and the publisher relationship may be great on previous games, and they decide they want to dip their toe in the water and self-publish their next title or whatever it may be. Um, that would be, uh, you know, that, that's a good fit for us because then some games are published with the publisher, some games are self-published, and and again, it just comes down to kind of you know the aspirations for the studio that you that you want to be and how you want to uh, how how you want to run your business. Great, thank you. Uh, one more question with our uh, from our listeners: How publishers can decide the game is not more profitable? Uh, how publishers can decide if the game is not more profitable? Yeah. Um, not sure I quite understand, but the I mean, look, what a good publisher is going to do is always be super focused on these metrics and should always be in you know investing if the game is profitable, right? If the game's not profitable, yeah. then obviously the publisher can add a ton of value in terms of you know helping tweak 
monetization strategies, game loops, and all the rest of this. And one of the huge value adds that they provide is they, they've just been there and seen it and done it a lot of times, and they know what works. So that, that the thing to focus on, if the UA is not working, um, <clears throat> you can always go back and make make the product better and so on. But it's a it's a question of you know do you have time to do that? The the, the half life of I mean, hyper casual development is so quick. You don't you don't see people who you keep going months after months after month tweaking the same game. So it needs to happen in a very very fast loop. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is it. We have uh, no, not a minute anymore. I really appreciate this important talk. Thank you for your time and Great. for your knowledge shared to the audience. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.